All right, so uh, we'll start. Our first paper uh, is uh, Dion uh, Mitford, The Transformative Power of Transkin. Okay. Where do you want me to stand? Wherever you want to stand. Okay. I don't know whether it's going to be projected. Thank you. The story that I am now about to narrate goes back two decades. I am presenting it now because it is only now that I fully realize how much my professional life was changed by it and how much this episode changed my client and me. My name is Dionne Mefsud and I have been a counselor for 33 years, working as a counselor at schools, in schools at the University of Malta and in private practice. In my career, I have been the head of the university counseling service, the head of the Department of Psychology, the head of the Department of Counseling, the president of the Malta Association of Counseling, the president of the International Association of Counseling. You may think that all these titles give me some kind of identity. No. What has given me identity and meaning in life has been the encounter between two persons, one in the clarity, the other is it will be a companion and the former search for clarity. Next slide, please. Over the course of 33 years, I have been counselor to thousands of clients and all have left an important mark in my life. The story of this young woman continues to brighten my life because of all the representations that it has stood for and all the meanings it has generated. The first time I saw her, I was shocked. She was a bachelor student, and she had a cruel, dark, red birthmark, which completely disfigured her face. That dark red patch did not just disfigure her face. It also attracted all the attention towards it, obliterating her personhood. She immediately noticed my reaction and said, I think you know what I want to speak about. She was a very bright student, a straight A student. She used to say that her academic rigor was a compensation for that birthmark that dominated her life. Next slide, please. People do not see me. They only see it. This was what she called the birthmark. They look at it, stare at it, speak to it. They have a relationship with it, not with me. They communicate with it and only speak to me about it. I do not exist. Only it exists. She looked at me intently and asked me, do you see me? Can you see me? Can you see, beyond, can you see me beyond this red mask? At this point, I was truly ashamed of myself because I tried to look at her, but my gaze was impotent and could only connect with that bird one. It was as though someone had placed his hand like this on her face and left its imprint permanently in dark red. So I mumbled a question. What do you want from me? Help me to accept it. Help me to accept this thing. Help me to face the mirror every morning. Help me to be able to put on some makeup. Help me to feel a person. Help me to feel a woman. Next slide, please. We embarked on a two-year counseling journey. We focused on integrating that face. But she also wanted to work on her belief and fear that in all probability, she would never have the possibility of forming a family and to have children. Her reason was another shock to me. She said, I do not want to have children who will be scared to look at their own mother. Two years later, she graduated. On her graduation day, she was radiant, like I had never seen her before. She told me, I think I can have my graduation photo taken, and I think I can um, like myself in it. We terminated counseling two weeks after her graduation, but her journey did not end there. A year later, she knocked on my door again. She had a brochure in her hand. That brochure spoke of a new laser technique to eliminate dark red birthmarks like hers. She told me she had already been to a specialist clinic in London, but the doctors there that had not guaranteed anything. 
but she wanted to try her luck. She had to go through at least six laser sessions. The treatment cost her 20,000 pounds at school and flights and accommodation, which for a person who had just graduated was an enormous burden. Next slide, please. The treatment was phased with a session every three months. Every time she returned to Malta, her face looked more disfigured than before because of what the laser was doing to her capillaries. During our first two years of counseling, she had addressed the relationship she had with her birthmark. During the second bout, she worked on initiating a relationship with herself. When the second bout was finally over, the birthmark had lost its dark red intensity and had become a pastel pink that could be covered with foundation makeup. She was finally ready to face the world as herself, not as it. Following our second termination, I did not see her for some time. But over the past few years, I have met her, happily married and the mother of three children. I fondly remember our last sessions. She was speaking as a person who had power and control over herself. She worked to have the power to decide and to stop taking her decision in anger, decisions in anger or in fear or whatever it had been causing. She had become a woman who knew exactly what she wanted. She knew she did not need counseling now. She just needed validation and encouragement. Once we ended counseling, she had completely changed herself, physically, emotionally, spiritually. But she had also managed to change me. She had changed herself from being a person who was an invisible, was a, an invisible slave to a cruel burden, no full of psychological, pardon, I'm sorry. Um, for a psychological torment and carrying such a heavy burden. But she managed to free herself and a front life with courage, persistence, and determination, just changing the course of her life. And next slide, please. She changed me because I was skeptic that a simple encounter between two persons would give all that power and courage with an issue that appeared to be so cruel and so final. She changed me because from then on I realized that because of that relationship, one can believe in the power of recovery and in what courage and fortitude can do. Now I am a firm believer that a simple encounter like counseling can be the strength for radical change. Counseling can be this, a journey of accompaniment. In this case, a five-year journey split in two, where my client transformed herself from a wounded girl to a mature and powerful woman. Sometimes it means accompanying a person through a dark forest, or over a metaphorical desert with the possibility that the client remains there, but also with the hope that the client resolves the impasse and moves on. For my client, the best part of the counseling journey was aimed at freeing herself from the malevolence of the birthmark, the second part on asserting herself in her new world. I learned a lot from here. I learned a lot about my own dark red birthmarks and the difficulties that they create for me. And I want to ask you to think about your own metaphorical dark red birthmarks. I have met clients in my 33 years of counseling and I have always been impressed by their fortitude and their hope. Every person has dreams and everyone tries to approach the metaphor of realities of that dream. Working as a counselor has been a privilege, walking with the clients towards well-being, towards illumination, towards liberation. Final slide, please. I would like to end with this slide. At one point, I commissioned an artist, himself a former client, and all the slides that you have seen actually belong to him, who journeyed with his own dark red mark um, that was severe dyslexia, and who for many years thought that he was stupid. This artist now has um, his works in all the major galleries in the world. Um, if you name them, they're, they're there. We asked him to paint an allegory of counseling, and this is the result. In, the, in this work, the artist captures a supreme aha moment in a perfect way. It is rainy, stormy, and bleak. Yet on the ground, there is some color in the red flowers. In the foreground, on the left side, a lighthouse symbolizes the light which kills the darkness and promises enlightenment and empowerment. It also lights up the background with a fortified citadel beckoning. 
a haven from the storm, a place to belong to and feel safe within, to get the nourishment you need and be ready and free when the storm has been weathered, and it is time to face the world again. A fortified citadel resembles that the security that our clients need for a counseling relationship to start changes and for change to not appear so daunting. Thank you very much. Powerful words and amazing images. That's amazing. Uh, our next presenter is joining us from the virtual world. Um, Anne Nakamura, what is well being composed of exploring how a musical medic defines well being? Anne, are you with us? Hello. Hello. Hi. <laughs> So I'll just um, share my screen, give me a second. Okay, can you still see my screen? Absolutely. Cool. Um, and is that still okay? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to, before I start, I'm just going to do a sound check because there's a um, audio aspect to my presentation as well. So, where's my mouse? Can you hear that? No. Sorry, could you hear that? No. Okay, that's... Okay, right. Right, um, give me a second. I'm just going to stop screen sharing for now. Okay, so people online can hear it, but it was just very loud. Yep, say so it was very loud on my end as well. Um, is your question needing to share sound? You may need to speak a bit louder as the microphone is not is very quiet. When you share the screen, you have yeah. to tick share the sound. Yeah. In the box. yeah. Maybe you've done that. Yeah. In yeah. In order to do that, and apparently there's a Zoom audio device that I've never had to download before. Um, oh. Oh. oh, yeah, like you haven't joined the audio in the Zoom. Oh, uh, to join up audio. No, so um, this one is just connected to the uh, screen. I've connected the audio from this laptop so that oh. we don't get uh, feedback oh. um, is what's happening. <laughs> This isn't uh, to do with that. Oh, oh I like your idea. And is it going to take you a while? Should we move to the next presentation? Come back to you. Yes, please. Okay, we'll move to the next presentation, and then we'll come back to Anne. Okay. Yeah, okay, so we're going to move on to uh, Mike Kivers. Uh, Mike's going to talk to us about uh, adventures in the multiverse with Vincent van Gogh. I have the screen facing well, Let me just share screen. So we can do anything, just takes a little while from the <laughs> Yes, do you want to give it a test? Oh, no, 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 no
offers a glimpse into how autoethnography completely transformed my creative writing PhD research project, which incorporates the creation of a film screenplay. Stan and Jack is a biopic about the origin of Marvel films. Now, most people know Stan Lee as the sole creator of Marvel's iconic superheroes. But the real story is how Jack Kirby was the true creative powerhouse, a man that Time magazine called the greatest artist you have never heard of. Author Alan Moore said, I met Jack Kirby and Jack Kirby created those characters. I'm inclined to say he created almost all of them by himself. And I met Jack Kirby too, a genuine hero of mine, because as a working class deaf kid, his comics taught me not only how to read, they taught me the power and sheer joy of stories. So by fusing two maligned art forms, the biopic and the comic book, I wanted to explore society's obsession with origin stories, beginnings, and also that nebulous notion at the heart of them of what is truth. However, Despite my PhD proposal being accepted, I felt dissatisfied. There was an absence. But what was it? It took something unexpected and unwanted to ultimately realise what was missing. That something, that inciting incident, was leukaemia. Mere hours before my very first meeting with a potential supervisor, a routine doctor's appointment revealed some concerns. Months later, at Christmas, I received a special gift, chronic lymphocytic leukemia. Don't worry, I was told, that's a good cancer. <laughs> I was shaken, but still started my PhD, remaining focused, academic, objective, albeit under a cloud of uncertainty. But then 2020 arrived and delivered absolute certainty. A double whammy of a pandemic and a now aggressive leukemia, I descended into 15 months of lockdowns, blood transfusions, steroids, and ultimately chemotherapy. Being immunocompromised, being vulnerable, affected my physical and mental health. I needed to hit pause. I kept thinking to myself, why am I wasting time writing stories about strangers? What about my story? Why is that so unimportant? It was at this low point I discovered autoethnography and realized that my story was far from unimportant. My life, my experiences, especially this cancer experience, were undeniably intrinsic to my project. This was the absence I had always felt, me. Laurel Richardson says, when we objectify ourselves out of existence, we void our own experiences. And by truly existing within my research, I moved beyond academic reflections on theories, techniques, to truly experience an origin story narrative by constructing one of my own. What Ken said yesterday, showing, not telling. Robert Desai proposes that the well-told story of a life spirals like coils of smoke around an emptiness, giving shape to that void. I began to give shape to my void in reflections, poems, stories, and even scenes from an unmade movie of my life, fictionalizing my life just as I was fictionalizing Stan and Jack's. And I discovered something more. No matter how far we drift from reality or facts, we still arrive at some form of the truth. As screenwriter Aaron Sorkin says, biopics are paintings, not photographs. The fact they fictionalize is never an impediment to finding the truth. I saw how the smallest of narrative choices actually creates a whole new branch of reality, a multiverse, if you like, an alternate history that speaks with all other histories, creating worlds, or again, it's Ken's digestive, worldly. 
Now, instead of merely analyzing screenwriting craft, I focused on the stories themselves as distinct entities, specifically how competing biopics arise around one singular life, offering different perspectives, different truths, creating different worlds. Look at all these Marie Curies. Look at all these Emily Dickinsons. And Vincent van Gogh became one of my key research subjects. In the classic biopic, Lust for Life, his story is framed as a religious quest. But if we tread the exact same story beats, other movies offer us a multiverse of innocence. In Pialet's Van Gogh, he's an ennui-filled rock star with a <laughs> doomed life of hedonistic excess. Whereas in At Eternity's Gat, his mental illness is misunderstood and feared, and his death is actually a murder, not a suicide. While in Loving Vincent, he is completely absent. His life is only realized in fragments, like a crime procedural from the testimony of characters within his paintings. However, one of the most perceptive representations of Vincent's story comes in an episode of Doctor Who. <laughs> Here, Vincent is brought by the TARDIS to the present day and sees just how valued his life and art has become. And this gets to the heart of why Vincent's story and indeed all life stories appeal to us so much. We can never write our own ending. What Vincent learns from his ending is that he matters. His life, his art, his struggles, his story, it all matters. Across all multiverses, all variants, his story matters. And in using autoethnography at a time of crisis in my life, in telling my story, I hope I matter too. And I hope for my fellow travellers with cancer, their stories matter too as well. So, as I chopped up, edited, fabricated parts of Stan and Jack's life, so I did the same for mine. As I, struggled, as I structured their story into five acts, so I did for mine. Each side of the process, screenplay, exegesis, talking to and influencing the other. Facts, fantasy, fiction, working together to give shape around the void. Stories talking to stories. As Donna Haraway says, it matters what stories we tell to tell other stories with. It matters what stories make worlds, what worlds make stories. I realized my life is just a collection of stories from past, present and future, all coexisting simultaneously. This inspired me to redraft my screenplay in a radical way, making time non-linear, fragmenting narratives like memory and transforming Jack Kirby into an interdimensional presence, traveling through reality, fantasy, the past and the future. Because Jack was always that invisible presence in my life. The fictions he created every bit as real to me as anything flesh and blood. His work, his stories, his multiverse of infinite possibilities, all residing with me even now. Our lives are filled with stories and the ghosts of stories. And in conclusion, it would be fair to say, autoethnography saved my life. Instead of thoughts of dying, I became filled with stories of living. It not only gave me a vital presence within my own research, but also the opportunity to craft a new reality, my very own multiverse, and the hope of many more stories yet to come. It made me, albeit briefly, matter. Thank you. And as Stan Lee would say, Excelsior. <laughs> Good. Thank you, thank you. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, how are you getting on? I should be okay. Let's give this one a go. Let's give it a go. Yep. Oh, hang on. No, 
that's not working for us. I can't share my sound at the same time. Can you do without the sound? Uh, I, I can, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's the only way from here. I, I can't get the sound to work. It needs a login and the part, it's not accepting my password, so. Okay. Are you able to play your sound through something else? Like uh, if you have a phone Which or if you have a tablet, etc., or something that you can play the sound through? Um, I it, can it, like, try. It might come out a little distorted, but it, hey, it's better than nothing. <laughs> okay. Um. Sorry about this. Please bear with me. That's all right. Don't worry. Don't yeah. worry. Technology doesn't yeah. always want to work for us. <laughs> Would it be possible to email the presentation? So I do have the presentation, um, but it won't mean that the other people on Zoom will be able to hear it. It would just mean that everyone in this room can hear it. So um, we want to make sure everyone can enjoy the presentation. <laughs> Maybe we'll maybe we'll move on again and come back to you, Anne, while you're looking at the phone option. Okay. Okay, I think I've just okay. found it. <coughs> okay, we'll we'll move on. You sort that out. And we'll come back to you. Okay. Um, so, our okay. Next, sorry about this. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Our next presenter is on line two. Have we got Sam Robertson with us? Yes. Okay, so Sam is going to talk to us about personal reflections on the emotional labour involved in researching the emotional labour of fellow mental health care workers. Thank you, Sam. Over to you. Right, you're just sharing my screen. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Right. So, good morning, everybody. Um, I, I feel um, um, coming after Mike. I feel, oh my God, I've got a lot to, lot to uh, uh, keep. You know, um, um, you know, such a high bar there. So, so thank, thank you. Um, so um, I wanted to uh, talk to you about, um, I suppose, something quite different in what we've heard so far today. Um, and I will, as I go through, I'll explain the term, the terms, um, rather than trying to sort of bombard you all now. So I'm, I'm Sam. Um, I, um, uh, am, I, I have a number of roles in Sussex Partnership, which is an NHS uh, mental health trust on the uh, Sussex coast encompassing Brighton and I suppose the, the thing I want to sort of say from this slide is that there's two images of me there one the actual image of me um, but also the 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 impact of my work that inhabits it, the, that where we wear the mask and that's where the emotional labor is and as I say Please, uh, for those of you who um, are not from the UK, if anything that you don't understand in terms of NHS uh, acronyms or whatever, and I'm hoping that I don't use them, please just shout. Okay. So, my reflections on my emotional labour when I'm involved in researching the emotional labour of other people. So, it's a it's a it's a once removed, but it's a very important distinction. So background, um, um, in mental health, peer workers are an important part of the workforce. And by peer worker, we mean someone that shares, they, they have to have lived experience as part of, part of their role. They have to have had it either in terms of their own mental health or uh, uh, in a caring capacity. And they have to have it, but be willing to use it appropriately as part of their role. And that's the key word there, appropriately. Um, so 
the sense that, you know, someone's coming with lived experience and they're wanting to share that to support another person who has lived experience recovery. Um, so peer workers are well established in the NHS, um, but they're relatively recent and increasingly important. So there's going to be about a tenfold increase in the next few years of the number of peers that are employed in the NHS. Um, and what I noticed in Sussex, we're very, we're, 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 you know, we're one of the leaders in this in the country. But what I noticed was that we're employing peers increasingly in more complex roles. Um, so we're, we're seeing peers going on to inpatient wards and into forensic services, as well as community roles, which might be considered a softer option. Um, but so we're asking people to have lived experience, but what we, we, um, we don't understand is the impact on them. And I'm a peer myself and I'm employed for my peerness, but we know it has an impact, but we don't. We, there, was, there wasn't much evidence on that. And anecdotal evidence suggests that peer workers may experience a significantly higher emotional impact. I remember when I was actually uh, talking about this research and someone said, why are you only looking at peers? Because as humans, we all have emotional labor. And I said, yes, that's absolutely true. But peer workers have to have lived experience and to use it appropriately. That's not true of other, other uh, roles in the NHS. So uh, the, the study, PAL, uh, Peer Emotional Labour, uh, as we've just completed it, it's an exploration of the experience of different kinds of peer workers in Sussex Partnership, uh, with particular focus on the emotional labour, but with the aim of developing a good practice guide because for peer working. So how could, how could the trust support support um, uh, the peers in the workforce. So PAL, we, as I say, initial exploration, um, and it was quite important because all the previous uh, research had been done, either looking specifically at one role across the number of trusts, so very functional, or, um, so, so we want to look at different, different roles uh, within, within uh, Sussex. Um, importantly, qualitative participatory reaction research, so where the whole study was co-produced and co-researched, um, so it's been a, a team effort throughout. Oh. And probably the most important thing is myself as the chief researcher and my co-researchers, we were not neutral and we all had an insider perspective and that, and we, we made no bones about that. That was really important. So trying to think about what, so what was the impact on me, which was noticeable from the, from actually writing the grant application, um, there were a number of things. And I suppose trying to think actually the, the how we could sort of tie it all together was actually, was the difficulty for me of speaking truth to power. And I think that encompasses a lot of what went on for me. Um, and and that that is that is something that I'm grappling with. I've grappled with in terms of uh, how within the, uh, the current study, but also in terms of my my next grant application, where I'm going to be uh, running uh, PAL research in other trusts and also using autoethnography to for, for peers to um, for their lived experience. Um, so. Thinking about that um, truth to power, what were the impact of me as a researcher? And I think, you know, in terms of being this, this coin, this phrase, wounded researcher with an insider perspective, that, that sort of meant that I, I, I was constantly triggered by what I was hearing from other peers. Um, um, the empathy and the, the was, was, was huge. Um, and I think part of that was down to the fact that I inhabited many different roles, often conflicting. So I often felt that I was um, sitting on a very high fence that was topped with barbed wire. I pleased nobody. And, you know, I, I have three roles in the trust. I am uh, the, the lead for uh, public and patient involvement in research. I lead on one of the research themes. Uh, I am um, a 
a peer fellow, research fellow, and actually I got a fourth though, I'm a peer lead in the trust. I please nobody in this in this work. And that was that was really difficult. And and really, where do I go for the support? And that was something that I hadn't actually thought about in terms of this research in that I'd made sure that I supported everyone else, but I didn't actually put in place any support for myself, and which I did subsequently where I got independent peer, peer support outside the trust. And I suppose the, the, the last thing, because I'm just on my, my time, is... One of the key things for me in all the work that I do is relational ethics. And it's about telling the stories of other people in, 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 in my work. And again, that was the truth to power thing was a big, a big issue. Um, so I think I could, I could talk to you about this forever. It's been a whistle stop tour. Um, and I, I appreciate that I've um, not been able to explain things as fully as I would like, so I'm happy to take any questions when, when it's appropriate. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It was a, a, a very nice discussion of the complexities of it all. Thank you. Um, and how are you getting on? I've got it set on my phone, so it should be okay. Really? I'll give this and I'll go. Okay. okay. Um, right, can you all see my slides now? Yes. And can you also see um, Zoom at the bottom as well? No, we just see your presentation. Okay, I'll just close it for me because otherwise it's blocking half the content. Okay, um, so my name's Anne. I'm a fourth year medical student and my project is What is Wellbeing Composed Of? An exploration of how a musical medic defines wellbeing. I'll give you an overview of my project, reflects back on how my relationship with music has changed and look forward to how understanding our individual well-being may aid in the creation of a health and well-being culture within the NHS. So how many of you have felt stressed, drained, exhausted at any point in your life? <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but, but these experiences affirmed my belief that we all need ways to look after our well-being so we can feel and perform at our best so we can flourish. Flourishing and well-being are interrelated concepts. Currently, we have many models for flourishing. They generally agree that it combines feeling and functioning well, and that well-being contributes to flourishing. But how they define well-being affects what elements are included in each model. Some suggest that if well-being is an individualized concept, that it is our values that contribute to well-being. So if our values are not reflected within these models, they can't apply to us. They suggest that instead of allowing others to define well-being, we should be the ones to define it. We all have personal experiences that have contributed to our well-being. We are also in the best position to judge how these experiences have contributed. Therefore, we have the answers to define what well-being means to us. So my question is, what is my well-being composed of? To answer this, I used autoethnography. I reflected on four wide contexts related to playing violin and viola as they have constantly supported my well-being throughout my life. I've included excerpts from my reflections on the following slides. The first was starting violin lessons. These reflections span from the ages of five to 11 where I learned the basic skills and played with others for the first time. The second was getting through the grades. Whilst this was a challenging and occasionally tedious time, steady progress was made. The third describes the time after I finished my grades and can play for pleasure. I started viola and wrote about experiences of playing with other musicians. The last wide context explores my experiences in performance. So as a soloist in a concert, informally for a friend and for residents in a care home and patients in psychiatric ICU. I reflected and composed at the same time. By composing, I gained a deeper understanding of what elements make up my well-being. And with thematic analysis, I found six themes. 
To help explain my themes, I've prepared audio clips and broke down part of my composition. So all music is built upon the bass. Like the bass, support runs throughout all four wide contexts and forms the foundations of my well-being. It allows me to interact with the other elements, such as positive emotions and significance. Tonality, otherwise known as the key, affects the emotions in the piece. For example, major pieces, major keys express joy or happiness, and minor keys can express sadness or distress. Positive emotions directly contributed to my well-being because they encouraged me to keep engaging with music. Negative emotions didn't directly contribute. However, they encouraged me to act so I could engage in what contributed in the long term. So this is what support and positive emotions sound like together. Oops. Could you all hear that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. So next, rhythm, like the one used here, describe, drives the composition forward. Similarly, significance affects my commitment towards music throughout all wide contexts. Instrumentation describes the instruments in the composition. They all interact in different ways. The theme of connections appeared most frequently in playing for pleasure and for others. Connections can form through contribution and collaborations. Connections are important because they allow me to make meaningful relationships with others. In my composition, the melody and harmony repeats and evolves, reflecting the theme of development, which describes progression and improvement. Development is important because my efforts are contributing to an activity that allows me to engage with the other themes. So the combination of the five elements so far sound like this. So next we have dynamics and articulation which describe the volume and how notes are played respectively. They add expression and excitement to a composition. This mirrors authenticity, which describes self-expression without the fear of negative judgment. So the final composition sounds like this. So to summarize, there are six elements. Support forms the foundations Upon, the, upon which the remaining five can come about. They all interact and coexist with each other, culminating in a composition called well-being. So looking back on my project, one strength was my method. Well-being is a very personal experience, making autoethnography particularly suitable. And by tapping into a wide range of experiences, allowed me to gain a detailed understanding of my well-being. However, it was also a weakness. My model may be incomplete as I only reflected on a handful of experiences, but perhaps through continuous reflection, we can continue to deepen our understanding of the elements of our well-being. Whilst it was never one of my aims, my model also aligns with the definition of flourishing, being feeling and functioning well. This could be a coincidence. I'd like to repeat my project with more people to see if their models of well-being also overlap with this definition. I have noticed that my relationship with music has also changed. I returned to orchestra rehearsals with an understanding of what my well-being is composed of. During the first rehearsal, I was actively working out how my viola part fit in with the others. I knew I did this before starting this project, but my awareness of the other parts felt more acute. This rehearsal was significant for another reason. I joined Imperial College Symphony Orchestra this year, not knowing anyone. I find it difficult to initiate conversations with unfamiliar people, especially when I'm tired or stressed. But this time, I felt more confident to connect with others during the break. Understanding my well-being appears to have enriched activities that I knew supported my well-being before. I'm looking forward to seeing how else this understanding may, may, may do this. I'd like to see if other individuals would have a similar experience, if they understood what contributes to their well-being. Understanding one's composition of well-being may also support in the creation of a health and well-being culture within the NHS. The NHS revised their health and well-being framework in 2021, which now aims to empower NHS organisations in creating a sustainable well-being culture 
for their workforce. They produced a toolkit which can be flex, which can flexibly support the unique well-being needs of any NHS organisation. NHS England followed the progress of 24 trailblazer organisations as they used the toolkit and published a report on the lessons we can learn from their experiences. This report emphasised the importance of active discussions with staff during the diagnostic, planning and implementation stage. If staff members had an understanding of what their wellbeing is composed of, they may be able to use this to further aid these discussions. In addition, individuals can engage in activities that support their wellbeing whilst, interven whilst interventions are being planned. Whilst this does not address the workplace stresses themselves, they can support an individual's well-being in the meantime. So I will leave you with this question. What is your well-being composed of? I've also included a QR code to my original composition if you're interested in having a listen through the whole thing. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for persevering. And what a wonderful phrase, composition of my well-being is. Yeah, really great. Um, so now we have uh, Joanne Maxton. Joanne in the room? No, no, she's um, online. Joanne, you're online, Joanne? Oh, great. Okay, so uh, Joanne is going to talk to us about self-injury and emotion with counselling. Hi, Joanne. Over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Yes, um, I'm Joanna. Um, I'm just going to kick off straight into it, really. Um, so I've got something to read to you. Um, so autoethnography treats my emotional experience of working with clients whose self-injury is worthy of inquiry and enables me to examine myself within the culture of self-injury and counselling, which I'm a major part I want to invite you today to um, experience with me a short journey into what it's like for me to work with clients who self-injure. I have to start with permission. Permission, permission to leave the table, permission to speak, hold your tongue, be a lady. Permission to grow out of young and into old, to adult and to speak. Permission to be, permission to research, permission to feel, and now permission to share. The things that therapists shouldn't do, well, therapists shouldn't experience negative reactions because doing so jeopardizes the therapeutic relationship and the client's care. Counselors should not show shock or communicate these feelings to clients. I must not be overwhelmed and I must be in control of my feelings. My impure, defiling, animalistic and disgusting emotions should not run riot. Therapists must not message a client at night, right? Well, she was asleep. She'd arranged to meet and she didn't attend again. I am cross. I haven't replied to her a message of apology almost two hours later, and I sit on the bed contemplating and looking at my phone. I am stubborn. I am intrigued by my process of trying to make sense of my emotions, and I write about her, because that's about all I have. I have tried to separate my anger and my fear as I look out of the window, but anger, like depression, visits me like an unwanted house guest. The cloud in my mind, a blanket of irritation and rather itchy, much like the blankets my nana used to have on the bed. Impressive. The anger impulse under my skin is often prevalent and it takes different guises, such as displacement. For example, I'm irritated that my fire has gone out in my bedroom and I poke around the logs to try and get something to flame. It seems that when I have a goal to achieve and this is denied, I experience frustration. The goal is to make him better, I guess. I ruminate, I poke the fire and I blow it. The log protests with pitiful spits and I give up. She cuts with her when her attachments are threatened. She sends me pictures of her blades and tells me she's going to cut herself and I resist replying. Heck, what do I do? 
like being on the big seas without a compass in a trawler boat, a storm, quite lonely. But metaphor makes it easier. Mm -hmm. It's dark now and it's cold, it's snowing. And Sally, who cuts her particular ways to write words like bitch on her leg, she's on my mind. Therapists who work with clients who self-injure must not ask their clients to show them their scars or cuts. Yet, I want to see the word bitch on her skin, the rawness of it, the pale skin, the scarring. I want to see it for myself, but I stay silent and I never ask. Therapists must not suddenly yearn or think about slicing their own arms or visualize the blood running down their own skin. Shh. Don't admit it, but the literature written by those with lived experience is so attractive and so beautiful. Their story is so real and captivating. I guess there's something about a bad day, society's bad day, that can move me to wanting to relieve my own pain of life. Therapists must not think that they could do this to their actual arms. To think of this would make the therapist weird or odd or strange and a bit like them. That couldn't possibly be so. Working with people who self-injury is challenging, okay? The work is so evocative at various levels. Therapists should not want to watch their clients cut their arms. Therapists should not want to ask clients to involve them. I feel confused, stimmied, de-skilled. I fall into the chair. Perhaps the fear I feel is about failing to make a difference to her life, proving my fears of my being less than capable, less than competent and a useless therapist. The noxious quality of shame tugging at my awareness of falling short of my aspirations and expectations of perfectionism and achievement. I want to help her, but I'm fed up with wasting my time. I feel like ending it and referring her on. I don't even believe he was asleep. What's the point? I give it. I reflect on the time when I was with her. I add a little candle wax with just a smidge and the fire responds with a glow. Much of my attending with Sally comes from a warm, hot water bottle and Ovaltine kind of place inside me, or Horlicks and Bourbon Biscuit type of encounter. <laughs> first time that day she hadn't thought about hurting her skin or thrashing her head against the door and it's part of something part of a togetherness with me something she's not used to experiencing and at the same time I feel disgruntled with her I think back and reflect back and I'm in this school oh god it's like fuck I'm angry she's left the room and cut herself and how did that happen on my watch the fire is burning now, flaming high, catching the logs with gumption. I'm struck by the beauty of the energy in the fire and I'm struck by the power of my memory. On reflection, I'm sure, I'm sure if I was angry in that crisis moment, the feeling thought of oh, God is more nuanced than anger alone. I think more carefully, I think more accurately, I felt a scared frustration at the trapped nature my client and I felt a powerless frustration that turns to God and belong to me and a feeling of helplessness on behalf of my client, her back against the wall, head bowed, my head low, finding her eyes. Both of us spliced yet split in the uh, moment the school yeah. dealt with her self-injury as if the action wasn't a part of her. There was shame and humiliation in the room and I was fed up, just so fed up and it felt like shame for me too an excruciating human emotion that seeped into my core and a searing incision that grew into a shame obstacle to interpersonal connection. A shame obstacle getting in the way of our work together and I felt squashed. My arms dropped to the sides and I breathed in a sorry <laughs> breath of sad exasperation. We were living in our shame, a most contagious emotion. As her shame of exposure reverberated with my shameful experience of not knowing that she was about to go cut. Yes. But the dichotomy is, um, even if I knew she was going to go and cut, would I have stopped her? A good question. I'm not sure I want to answer here. 
shame in doing something different than what is advocated in the literature. Oh, Things yeah. that didn't do, a catalyst for shame to grow from the sense of one's actions as defective in the eyes of the other. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanna. Beautiful, powerful. Thank you. I'm sure you'll agree with me. Five really great presentations there. And um, we've got uh, plenty of time for some chat. Mike, would you like to come and sit with Dion, maybe? So we've got kind of our presenters together. Um, please, as I said, if you if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment. Please speak up and, and give us your name as well. That would be really nice. Can I make a comment? Well, Beverly. Yeah. Be oh, Beverly. yes, Beverly and Beverly. Sheffield Uni. Right. Um, two people I'd like um, to question. Um, first of all, Mike. Could I ask, you know the slides and the work you've done for this conference, will you be including them in your research? Because I thought they were really excellent. That's a good question because it's, it's uh, when you're producing a screenplay and, uh, and that forms a big part of the PhD, um, especially a screenplay, which is a very industrial document, they, they typically have to follow a very, very precise format. And the moment you kind of move beyond that, you could quite easily have someone who's um, looking at this and marking saying, it, it doesn't hit the professional standards. Why have you got the photo in there? And things like that. But having said that, these things are changing all the time. Yeah, there's the, the contemporary screenwriters are putting pictures in there. And I do believe that Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer, he was written it in the first person which is unheard of for a film screenplay. I can't wait to read it. Um, so I may well include pictures because, yeah, they do express a lot. They, I wanted it to feel like a comic book because <coughs> lots of fans of the pictures and, and that's what comic books kind of are about, this sort of explosion of different imagery. So, yeah, there's a good point and one I'm going to take on board. All right, thank you. And then... This next question is for Sam. Um, can you hear me okay, Sam? I, I was yeah. really surprised by what you said because you said that you're going to use autoethnographic um, work in this clinical practice. But even myself trying to do a postdoc, looking at postdocs, a lot of people say, no, autoethnography will not fly. No, you're going to have to do something else. So how did you convince the funders that it wasn't just a self-indulgent project? Welcome to my world. Um, yeah. <laughs> I, I, um, I'm going to take you back a bit to my PhD. Um, that I, I did um, my PhD at the University of Southampton in health sciences, in the Faculty of Health Sciences, and to get qualitative work through was a biggie, let alone autoethnography. And I, I remember talking to my supervisor saying um, that I, I really wanted to explore explore this as a process. And they said, you'll never work, you know, all, all that sort of stuff. And me being a challenging, uh, uh, what's the name, said, I will make it work. And what I did in my first year of my PhD was build the evidence to say that autoethnography was an absolutely important methodology for what I was wanting to do. And 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 I, I remember I was at a conference where Alec Grant talked and and I, I then uh, presented at the Autoethnography Conference in, in, in Brighton, and I took my supervisor along, and she said, yeah, I see why you're doing this now. And it was the most important thing for my PhD. It was the basis of my PhD. And, and since I've been um, out in the real world, basically, <laughs> I keep banging on about it. And 
I'm in a position now to actually say, no, I we need to look at other other methodologies. And and I often feel that I'm banging my head against a brick wall, but um NIHR, which is the National Institute of Health Research, I've just put out a call, which is unheard of, for <sighs> creative methodologies. So they've gone away from the, you know, the randomized control. They they want and they want to um support researchers that do things differently. And that's where I come in. And and so I want to in 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 the grant application I'm doing at the moment, uh, and I'm gonna be working with Jamie, uh, Jamie's gonna come on board with me, is that in exploring peers' lived experience. You know, I've done it the way that they wanted in terms of focus groups and all that kind of stuff. Now I want it from the horse's mouth. I want to support people to develop their autoethnography. And and a part of the research as well is all the co-researchers at the different sites, I want to support them to develop their autoethnography of the process of being co-researchers co as well. So I think it's sticking to your guns um and and really just actually saying no this is the methodology that is the right methodology for what i'm wanting to do mm -hmm. and it's like when i i wrote my my first paper of, of my phd i i went to the um to the journal editor and said i cannot write this in the way that you would normally expect either will you accept will you look at it as this way or i won't bother i'll go somewhere else and they say Come, yeah, we'll look, we'll look at it, and and so it's it's been. I suppose it's willingness to have that bit of um, thick skin and hold your ground, because there's a lot of evidence, and we are in our work. So, so for example, the study I've just you know just finished, we now have a language for peers to express what their emotional labour is, and so we're developing the evidence as we go. So stick to your guns, girl. Thank you. <laughs> Great advice. <laughs> okay. I think Elise has. Oh, Elise. Uh, good morning. I'm Elise. What an extraordinary uh, panel. All five papers. Uh, what a joy to get up in the middle of the night and and <laughs> right here. So so thank you so much. I think a comment, particularly to Sam and and Joanna, working side by side here, that really seem like right hand left hand um, of research around empathy and the emotional labor uh, and experience uh, of these two. I'd written a comment uh, listening to you, Sam, and I don't work in mental health, but empathy is so often framed as always good that we work for that and we forget. And I think your work makes so clear that empathy is, can be wounding, that it is burdensome, but that part of the ethical imperative is to willingly take up the wounding burden of being present in our full emotional life um, with others. And then Joanna, what an extraordinary piece. Uh, it's a beautiful piece of writing I think it exemplifies many of the things that Sam is talking about in terms of making visible the viscera of the emotional life of, of the client and the constraints of traditional ways of working. You know, I surely understand that there need to be boundaries and all of that, but not conceptually. And while it had a rawness to it, it was also controlled intentional, careful. This is not suddenly bare my soul. This was uh, an artistic, intentional, deliberate crafting of what is usually hidden and chaotic. Um, and I think for me, those two pieces together just resonated um, wonderfully. And so thank you so much for giving me both of those those ways. And so Sam, as you go out and make these arguments, um, this wonderful kind of writing is itself an embodied uh, argument. So beautiful work. Yeah, if I could um, come back on that. I mean, I, I actually um, felt a bit of a fraud being in this panel because um, in that, I suppose, 
I actually wrote autoethnographic auto pieces for this research, but mm -hmm. I, um, with the eight minutes, I thought I needed to take them out to actually talk about the process. Mm -hmm. And and I felt, oh my God, you know, people, you know, everyone is, is, is sharing their souls with me. And I'm talking about academic, and I thought, oh, you know, I'm I'm not. So it's really heartening to be placed in that. And mm -hmm. just and just one thing, one of the one of the big things that came up for us was toxic positivity. And oh, that, wow. that, <laughs> that yeah, everything is is wonderful. And and actually, mm -hmm. I I I uh, there was a wonderful metaphor from uh, one of the peers that we were working with, and he said, you know, as a peer. I open the door and I'm working with another peer. I have no idea what they're going to bring with me today. And they say, right, shall we talk about um, self-harm? So as a as the peer worker, I'm scrabbling in all my drawers to find all the bits about self-harm that I need to talk about and to share and to support. And then they then go away and I'm left with this mess. And how do I do I sit with the mess? Do I put it all back in the drawers? Do I what do I do with this? And I thought that perfectly encapsulated peer support work and the and the journey. And and so when when and it, this is goes back to uh, when when people say emotional labour, it's all of us. No, it it it, it does impact us all as humans, but it's particularly you know a biggie. For peer workers. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Elise. Joanna, would you like to respond? Um, yes, I, I think it's interesting, Elise, that you pick up the idea that there's the emotion and then there's the control. And Norbert Elias talks about his civilization of humankind in, in his fantastic book. Um, of, of how we're curated and I guess that the idea that even within that piece of writing I was able as a woman to um, express my emotion my heartfelt taboo emotion which is the, which is going to be a big thing around my thesis that taboo emotion but present it in a way which can be accepted and absorbed and immersed and autoethnography is is the, the perfect platform for me to be able to do that um and, and that that outpouring of emotion can be curtailed um that that little bit even though that emotion is vibrant and volcanic in many times and and the palette of emotion that i experience and um, we're working with clients Joanne, if I could come back, I mean, I was so moved by by uh, what what you presented, and I think what, one of the things that we have to be careful of in in our work as well is it's very easy for others to pigeonhole hold us as othered. So in in how you presented, and and I suppose it's this it's that sense of actually we are not othered by being willing to share this. Uh, because I, I suppose I want to bring autoethnography out of those side side you know those 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 edges to actually bring it in line and say actually we are talking about ourselves or our experience but we're contextualizing it in a wide context mm -hmm. and we will not be othered by it. I, 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 I completely agree with you and I think um, the cult the, the work that I'm doing is about being in the culture um, of the literature and of the person and of me and how we have relationships between that and how being in those cultures um, impacts me as a therapist. Um, but also, which is, is so interesting, is how I also other, because, you know, <laughs> crazily, I other but then I yearn to be connected with the, somebody that's not me. I'm, I'm not that person, 
I'm going to observe you and talk about you, but actually I'm going to have an emotional response to it, which makes me the same as you. Gosh, what's that like? Do I really want to admit that I'm like you? No, because you self-injure. That's not me. But there's a whole host of those feelings that happen to me. Um, and I think that's going to be the transforming process that I become part of the other person uh, and that journey in between. Thank you. Dion, I think some of these points relate to your presentation too. I'm, you know, struck by the metaphorical dark red birthmarks. Yes, that we and how it impacts us, yeah. basically. Um, <laughs> Four years ago, I lost my father, and four weeks later, I had the first client who committed suicide. And the way that impacted me was huge. I think it impacted me much, much more than the death of my father, actually. And I was constantly thinking of how something like that could have, and I do actually um, um, uh, link with what Joanne has presented. And uh, how much of that was, in a way, some kind of um, thing that I forgot to check about, you know, how I mm. put myself into a good kind of situation, even though I know that I followed protocol um, uh, to the letter, basically. Um, but yes, I, I would fully understand how much these things can really become part of our story, even though we're there in a way to give a service, but mm -hmm. that kind of service. And I've been a counselor for 32 years, and I have to say every evening after I um, finish my counseling work, I'm still in a, in a trance, sort of, even going up the stairs because my clinic is just underneath our house. Um, so going up the stairs has to be a transformation from me being in a particular role to be becoming human again after the, 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 those hours in that, in that particular situation. And yes, I think it would be a good idea to write a little bit about that as well because um, it's completely in my mind and I can understand what, what Joanne was speaking about completely. Thank you. Thank you. So my question to you, sir, is, so what is your red mark in that? Oh, yes. Um, in, in the situation I just mentioned, yeah, yeah, that is a red mark. You know, um, I, I'm, I'm speaking about it today. I called the psychiatrist who was speaking to the client, and he told me um, this was bound to happen. We, all, we both know it was bound to happen. You know, and I was, in a way, I was shocked because obviously the, the standard of care is let's see what we can do, etc. He was also saying it's his right, he wanted to, to go, so that, that kind of thing. But for some reason, it still comes to me as if I have something to do with it. And that is my red mark, which I carry. And obviously over 33 years, um, this remains the only suicide um, that I had over 33 years. But over 32 years, there have been so many other incidents where I felt that I could have jumped down my job better, and that would be my red mark as well. Jenny. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, thank you to all the presenters. So, okay, really, yeah, fantastic presentation. So, just a couple of uh, one comment uh, for, from Dion's presentation, and then a, a question to, to Anne, actually. Um, so I was struck by uh, the question that the lady asked you uh, when she first came to see you, uh, this question of, do you see me? Um, and uh, it connects a lot to things that I've been thinking about in terms of um, recognition um, and the kind of human impetus and desire to be recognized. And I've been thinking a little bit about the, the roots of that, the cognito, the kind of known, to be known by someone else and, and the ways in which that desire for recognition can play itself out in so many different ways within human human life. So it was just kind of that thought, that powerful impetus of, you know, do you see me? Yes. Um, which is, yeah, no, no, but you can speak to that a little bit. But the other question was, uh, was to Anne, uh, in terms of, I thought it was a fascinating kind of, you know, exploration to, 
to explore well-being um, through the practice of music. And I was intrigued to know um, what you were able to get at in terms of expressing, expressing things about well-being through music that you couldn't necessarily access through words or if that was if that was the case um and i mean i'm now asking you to talk about that so it's a bit of an ironic question but um what you know were you able to get at things through through music that kind of took you beyond words that you know in terms of your kind of understanding of your own well-being um so so alongside my written reflections um i also did a composition so i took my written reflections and tried to communicate that in a musical manner and i felt that i mean <laughs> bearing in mind that i haven't done composition since a level music which is four years ago um trying to i guess seeing the same data but from a slightly different perspective and trying to use the i guess a different musical toolkit to express those same experiences allowed me to sort of flesh out those written experiences so it also evokes a lot of um i mean it has quite an emotional impact on me as well because i was for some of the reflections they were bringing back a lot of memories that i had talked about for many many years and that that process in itself it was it was quite nice. I really enjoyed it because, I mean, I, I'm very guilty of, you know, imposter syndrome and comparisonitis, but like when just looking back at the things that I've done, it just reminds me that actually, even though I'm not the greatest soloist or the greatest orchestral player, there are things that I have done and I've really genuinely enjoyed them so, so much. And that process in itself, I think, was very supportive of my well-being but yeah that was that's a really really interesting question so thank you very much hopefully that answered it i think i waffled a little bit but yeah. thank you can i also react on what you have said i mean we, we all know the issue about about gaze and we think or we try to think that gaze is something which is um, something that we choose to do. So we gaze at what we want to gaze at, and we do not gaze at what we do not want to gaze at. <laughs> In this situation, this, and I found myself not having any control over my gaze. Exactly. It was completely out of control. It went to it. Mm. And I think that is a very important, well, for me it was almost frightening how um, out of control it was. Fascinating, yeah. yeah. Last question. Quick, quick comment okay. um, about uh, Mike's uh, presentation. Um, I have been supervising ethnographic research in the University of the West of England, and I've been very encouraging to my students who feel that um, they don't have something worthwhile to, to say. <laughs> um, but I have been feeling that I, there is a story in me uh, that I would like to explore, and I have been feeling, you know, have the critical way of um, it's not worthwhile to be said and worthwhile to say. There was something about telling a story in order to tell a story, in order to tell your story. Um, mm -hmm. that, uh, it felt, it felt um, yeah, 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 it clicked with me. Mm -hmm. I think it inspired me perhaps to, yeah, try to do something similar in the future. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Yeah. Yes, do it, do it. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Great discussion. Thank you, especially to our presenters. Wonderful stuff.